of algebra section. Uh, so the first uh, speaker today will be Nicolas Antuskiewicz. He is a professor at the University of Cordoba, senior researcher, uh, researcher of Quelicet, and member of the Academia Nacional de Ciencias in uh, Argentina. He is uh, the vice president of the Union Mathematica Argentina since 2009, and he was an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow in the 90s. His scientific work concerns mainly problems of classification of algebra, of algebras, and he has published uh, uh, lots of articles on algebras and his theory. Uh, today he will give us a survey on the classification of finite dimension of algebra. Thank you very much. I would like to, before starting, I would like to thank the selection committee for the honor of inviting me here. I also would like to thank the local organizers for the organization, and specifically by the University of Manu. I would like to thank my Argentinian colleagues for their sympathy and support, especially to Guillermo Cortinas, who advised, advertised this talk. Thank you. And I would like to thank uh, my co-author Hans Jürgen Schneider from the University of Munich, with whom I did most of this work. So, there are some movies or books that start with the main event, and then they present the characters and what happened. For instance, they start by the robbery of the bank, and then they obey the characters, and then they invent the method of robbing this bank, how did they do that? So I will tell the story not in a linear way, but after all, time is a flat circle. So let me start by the main result. The main result says that I will give you some data, I will show you how to construct from this data a Hopf algebra, <coughs> and then I will tell you which class of Hopf algebras is exhausted by this construction. The data consists of some collections of objects. The first object is a finite abelian group. The second is a collection of elements in this group, GI, from 1 to theta. Then I also need a collection of characters, KI, from 1 to theta. And I will assume that the elements of the diagonal, QIIs, are not 1. I did not wrote this here, but I will also assume this is not this simplicity in this page. I will also assume that the order of QI is odd, and eventually also that it's not it's relativity prime to three. And the characters and the elements of the group will be connected by the following rule. Let me call QIJ the evaluation of the character KJ on the group, on the element GI of the group, so it's an abelian group, so this is a root of unity because G is finite. And I will assume that the symmetrization of this matrix QIJ that I defined in this way, so QIJ QGI equal to QII, I assume that this symmetrization equals QII to AIJ. Where AIJ is a Cartan matrix. So, to be precise, it's a Cartan matrix of a finite dimensional semi simple algebra. To this Cartan matrix, as I say, there is one attaches a semi simple algebra and one attaches a root system. Let me call the simple roots of this, so let us make, make me, allow me to make a choice of simple roots in the root system of this <coughs> matrix and call them alpha i, alpha, alpha 1, alpha theta. 
And then I need two more parameters. So, so far I have three, I have G, this collection and this collection, and this is part of the hypothesis. And I have two more parameters. One is a family of elements, lambda ij. Essentially, whenever i and j belong to different connecting components of the linking diagram of phi, and then I have another family of parameters in C, one for each positive root. These parameters should satisfy some normalization condition, but it is not important for this talk. The only thing I want to add is that from this family, we construct by recursively some elements of the group algebra of G. So for each alpha positive root, recursivity on the, on the length with respect to the simple roots. The elements corresponding to the simple roots are very easy to describe, and the others need some work, which I will omit. So these are the input. Recall that I say that QII has odd order. And the output is from this collection, D lambda mu, so D are the group, is the groups, the group G, the elements of the group, and the characters, and these are the two parameters. The output is the Hopf algebra presented by generators and relations. So the generators of the group with the relations of the group, which I do not write down. And theta generators, theta is always the rank of a matrix. The relations are the key eyes, the characters, are responsible of the commutation between the elements of the group and the x eyes. So they almost commute, commute up to this scale. Then we have the quantum cell relations, which are the application of an iterated operator, which is called the Brader joint. I define it here the grade that joint at the level of the simple elements, but uh, I do not pretend to learn that you learn this here. When A and J are connected, so in the same connected component, and when they are not connected, then we have these lifting relations. Then we have the power of the vectors. For this, I need to define inside this algebra some x alphas for each positive root alpha. And I take this power, where nj is the order of the qii, if i belongs to the connected component j. And this should be equal to this element of the group algebra. So these are called the power root vector relations. And the Hopf algebra structure will be given by this definition. Delta of j is j tensor so j, and delta of xi is j i tensor so xi plus Excited so This is a point of algebra. We can compute explicitly the dimension of this algebra, and we know that the group like elements are of this form. Conversely, if you have any point of algebra of finite dimensional, say that the group of group like elements is our previous abelian, finite abelian group G, if all prime divisors of the order of G are bigger than 7, then there exists this data T lambda mu such that H is of this form. And we can also describe, but I do not waste time doing this here, when these two cofalgebras attached to different data are isomorphic. So this is my main uh, this is my main result, and what I want to do is the following. First, I would like to make an introduction where I will explain you all the terminology I introduced in this paper, in, in these two slides. Of course not what is a group or something like this. Um, then I will explain the method of proof of this theorem. Then I will sketch the proof or the main ideas of the proof. 
And if there is enough time, I will explain what happens if the group is not abelian, if the group has divisors smaller, prime divisors smaller than seven, and some other generalizations that we have in mind. So what I will not do here, I will not give a full account, a full historical account of what happens. I do not have time for that. I just want to mention that this comes from, the, the inspiration for this result comes from the theory of quantum groups and developed by Trinfeld, and more specifically by the work of Lustig, the continuum Procesi on quantum groups, on small quantum groups, so quantum groups are groups of unity. This is one of the main inspirations. And I want to mention the names of Harchenko and Rosso, whose work is implicit behind these proofs. I will not mention any application of this result, what we believe could be applied. And I would like also like to say that this is a classification which is a bit strange in the sense that many times the objects you classify have a very clear and net description, like a finite groups of D-type. You know what they are after all, eh? finite groups of matrices over a finite field. Here, we do not have such descriptions. So we have a very technical description, which is very complicated. From a technical point of view, this is very useful, because if you have a presentation, by explicit presentation by generators and relations, then we can do many things with that. However, we do not have a description as some object acting somewhere. This is what one problem we so now let me introduce the characters of the story. I will work over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, which I will call C. <coughs> uh, the first notion I recall very quickly is the notion of an algebra. So this is a vector space provided with a bilinear form, so a map, linear map from A tensor A to A, and a map from the field to A called the unit. And they should satisfy this action, which is the associativity of the algebra, and another action which expresses the unitary action of the algebra. So U is the map that sends a scalar lambda to lambda times one. <coughs> Dually to this, there is the notion of coalgebra, which is, has been used in logic and computer science in the last years, which is formally dual to the notion of algebra in the sense that instead of having a map from A tensor A to A, you have a map from C to C tensor C, and you also reverse the order of the map called co-unit, it goes from C to the base field. And you formally dualize the commutative diagrams that you require for the associativity and unitarity of the algebra to say what a co-associative, co-unital co-algebra is as it's in this slide. Now it comes the definition of Hopf algebra. A Hopf algebra is a vector space provided with a lot of structure. On one hand, you have an algebra structure on this vector space, as what I said before. On the other hand, you have a co-algebra structure on this vector space. And you ask two compatibilities between this algebra and coalgebra structures. One is that the maps delta and epsilon of the coalgebra structure are algebra maps. And the other is the existence of the antipode. It's a map that mm, satisfies the commutativity of this diagram in this way. This is one of the cases where you have a definition and the definition does not tell you what really this notion is. To understand what this notion is, you, can, you should go through examples. Otherwise, it's not clear what happens. So the most obvious example is, no, natural example is the following. Take a finite group G and consider the algebra of functions of G to the complex numbers, to the field, then take the multiplication of G and transpose it and define in this way the multiplication delta and 
take as epsilon the evaluation in the identity element of the loop. Finally, take S as the transpose of the inversion of the loop. So all of this gives the vector space O of G a structure of a Hopf algebra because we just dualized the uh, um, structural maps of the loop. A further remark is that you have a finite dimensional Hopf algebra. These uh, maps and these axioms are given in such a way that if you take the dual of H and the transpose of all the maps uh, pertaining to the structure of H, then you get again a Hopf algebra. For instance, if you take the dual of the algebra of functions of G, you get the group algebra of G. Now, given a Lie algebra, given a Hopf algebra, we need to understand in order to attack this classification, some invariants of the Hopf algebra. The first invariant is the set of all non-zero elements such that delta of x is x tensor x. With the multiplication of h, this becomes a group called the group of group-like elements. The second invariant is the vector subspace of primitive elements. This is the elements x in H, such that delta of x is x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. This is a Lie algebra, this is easy to check, and furthermore, the group G of H acts on the Lie algebra of primitive elements by conjugation. So if x is primitive and G is a group-like, then G x G minus 1 is again primitive. Now, let me denote by to the usual fleet, which permutes the two tensorants of the vector space, so this is a small mistake here. Then clearly H is commutative if mu composed with to is mu, and H is co-commutative if dually to composed with delta is delta. Group algebras Enveloping algebras and in positive characteristic hyperalgebras are co-commutative. Furthermore, <coughs> Cartier and Costner independently proved that if the in this setting where C is algebraically closed of characteristic zero, then any co-commutative Hopf algebra is a kind of semi-direct product of the enveloping algebra of a, of a real algebra, which is the Lie algebra of primitive elements and the, a group algebra of a group G, which is the group of group like elements. So, there are three remarks I want to do about this theorem. The first remark is that is, this theorem is a kind of splitting of the Hopf algebra in two parts. One part is infinitesimal, which is U of G. And the other part is rigid, is the group algebra. The second remark is that this theorem is false in characteristic, in positive characteristic, because the, you, you do have such a splitting in infinitesimal part and rigid part, but the infinitesimal part is much more complicated because you can have extensions of of uh, co commutative finite dimensional co commutative of algebras, and you cannot control these extensions in general. So there is some phenomenon here which is very interesting. <laughs> a third remark is that U of G comes equipped with the filtration given by the length of the PVW basis. And the associated graded algebra of this filtration is the symmetric algebra of G. Well, I have to, the following two slides is to set some notation which I need to explain the method. So it's a bit technical, but I cannot avoid it. The first is some notation for some operation in coalgebras. If you have a coalgebra C and two sub-vector spaces D and A, then D, H, A is the 
vector space of all x in C such that delta of x belongs to d tensor C plus C tensor A. So, in the duality between coalgebras and algebras, this is orthogonal to taking the product of two subsets in the dual. Um, with this definition, I define recursively wage zero of d equal to d, and in general, wage n plus one of d by this formula. Now, the funda there are two fundamental invariants, which are the co-radical, so I had already the group lines and the primitives. Now the next invariant are the co-radical, which is the sum of all simple subalgebras of H. The first time I see, you see the co-radical, you do not understand why this is important. Uh, this is I can give you two explanations very short. One is this in the duality between algebras and coalgebras. This is orthogonal to the Jacobson radical of the dual. So it's from clearly this important invariant. And the other is the circle of H as a comodule over itself. Um, why do we look at these coalgebraic invariants? Because the, co the coalgebra structure is locally finite. And therefore, these methods can be adapted to the infinite dimensional case uh, better with this uh, terminology. Given the co-radical, one defines the co-radical filtration by this uh, rule, Hn is the wage n plus 1 of H0. And uh, now I can explain one of the words in, my, in these slides. Pointed means that the co-radical is equal to the group algebra of H, of G of H. So the elements of G of H, which are these group-like elements, span a one-dimensional subcoalgebra, which is simple. So the group algebra of G of H is always contained in the co-radical, so I assume that they are equal. The next point is the notion of braided vector space. A braided vector space is a vector space provided with a map C from V tensor B to V tensor B, which is a linear isomorphism, and satisfies the so-called Braid equation. The Braid equation is the equality of these two different compositions. This is an equality as isomorphisms from V tensor B to tensor B to itself. This notion of braided vector space is equivalent to a so-called quantum ambassador equation, and therefore it's related to many uh, phenomena in mathematical physics and low-dimensional topology. And in fact, uh, one of the main applications of the theory of cofalgebras is the systematic construction, construction of very uh, vector spaces starting from any cofactor. So this is a construction due to Greenfield. But now I have to explain very roughly another notion, which is the notion of braided cofactor. So this is a braided vector space, an algebra and a coalgebra, so it's very close to what a cofactor is, except that when I require delta to be an algebra map, the multiplication in R tensor R that before was the usual tensor product multiplication should be given by this formula. So what you do is you interchange the second and the third summand not by the usual transposition but by this braiding C. Braided cofalgebras appear in nature. This means that if you have a cofalgebra map, which is subjective from H to K, and this map admits a section, which is also a morphism of cofalgebras, then you define something that morally corresponds to the kernel of pi, so it's given by this equation, and this is a the cofalgebra. So it is not you should, one would expect that this to be a cofalgebra to play the role of a kernel, but this is not the case. It's, it's dual. So, 
And in fact, if H can be reconstructed, I do not want to explain this explicitly, but from R and K. So this is similar to the semi-direct product, but a bit more complicated. And in this case, one says that H is the bosonization of R by K. When you have a brain cofalgebra with this reconstruction. So I have to explain now the method. The method says the following. The main hypothesis is that the co-radical is a Hobbes algebra. For instance, if H is pointed, the co-radical is a Hobbes algebra because it's the algebra, group algebra of G of H. In this case, one takes the co-radical filtration, and this is not only co-algebra filtration as usual, but it's a Hopf algebra filtration, which means that if you consider the associated graded Hopf algebra, then this is again a Hopf algebra. Furthermore, this growth H projects onto, onto H0, and, there is a, and this projection splits the inclusion of H0 in growth H. And therefore, by the preceding slide, one can split growth H as R smash A0. And this R inherits the gradient from group of H. It's a braided of algebra, as I explained in the previous slide, but it's also connected. So it has, in degree zero, only the field, because the other part of the, of the zero part of group of H came here. So, one starts with H, assuming that the coradical is a Hobbes algebra. You consider the associated grain of algebra. This splits. This splitting is like in the theorem of Cartier Costa, in the sense that R is infinitesimal and A0 is rigid because it's cos semi simple. The fact is that R contains some special kind of Hopf algebra, which is called a Nichols algebra. So here, V is R1. I will explain in a moment what the Nichols algebra is. That let, let me repeat what I say. So I, in, in, in other words, or in other, from another point of view, Suppose that you have a semi-simple Hopf algebra K, and you want to classify all finite dimensional Hopf algebras H whose co-radical is isomorphic to K. Then what you need to do is the following. You need to classify all finite dimensional Gieter Dinfeld modules, which I will not explain what it is such that the dimension of the Nichols algebra is finite. So I will explain what is a Nichols algebra in the following slide. Once you classify all of them, you need to present them by generators and relations, or to be more specific, to give the set of defining relations. Then the second question is whether, under this context, V of V will be equal to L. I will explain a little bit about this also, which is the fact that this has a positive answer is what makes it possible to give a classification result. And finally, what, what if you check that R is B of V, then you have group of H, and then you have to come back and, ob uh, and obtain H. This going back from group of H to H is what we call the lifting. So what is the Nichols algebra? It's, I, I, I guess, I don't know, 100 talks <laughs> about Nichols algebras, and for me it's always difficult to explain, because it's a different object. It's a difficult object to understand. And I know five different definitions of Nichols algebra. I neither of them it's, makes it useful to compute a Nichols algebra. 
So maybe I will give the simplest definition and then I will show you some examples of Nicholas algebras. Then I think you will understand why uh, they are so complicated and I hope you will also like them as I do. So, a Nicholas algebra of a braided vector space is a braided Hopf algebra such that it's connected, it's graded, it is connected, which means that it has the field in degree zero. In degree one, you have a braided vector space, so this is the initial braided vector space that we have. And I require two conditions. One condition is that the primitive elements of this Nicholas algebra are located in degree one. And the second condition is that the degree one component spans the Nicholas algebra as an algebra. You see, the first condition is a quadrupedic condition, and the second is an algebraic condition. And they are dual to each other. So if you go to the graded dual, the first condition corresponds to the second, and the second to the first. Let me give some examples of Nicholas algebras. One easy example of graded vector space is any vector space with the usual transposition top. In this case, the Nicholas algebra is the symmetric algebra. If instead of tau you consider minus tau, you get the exterior algebra. If you take a super vector space and with a super transposition, you get the super symmetric algebra. And more generally, if you have a braided vector space that satisfies that C square is the identity, then you can check in characteristic zero that the Nicholas algebra is quadratic. It is generated by the elements of degree zero, of degree two. So the idea of relations is generated in degree two. However, let me give this example. C is Q to the B i A i J tau. So it's like I have a basis and I have the usual transposition and I make a perturbation of the transposition by this scalar Q to the di aij. Then what we, if Q is not a root of unity, then what I get is the positive part of a quantum group. And if Q is a root of unity, what I get is the positive part of a small quantum group. So this, the relations of this u q plus of g and u small u q plus of g are very complicated and they are definitely not located in degree two. There are two classes of braided vector spaces that I'm interested in. The first one is the class of diagonal type and the second class is the group type or rack type that I will explain later. If I have time. So, let me now give some answers that give rise to the proof of this classification theorem, assuming that G is a finite abelian group. And at the same time, I will say what remains to do when G is abelian, but the, is not relatively prime to 210. So, Again, I have a finite abelian group G, and I want to classify all finite dimensional Hopf algebras H such that H0 is isomorphic to, to the group algebra of G. The first question which I had before this is the, what I said about the lifting method, that there were three questions. The first question in this setting, in the setting where H0 is a group algebra of finite abelian groups, comes down to the following. Let me define a brain vector space of diagonal type as one that has a, a basis D1, D theta, and there is a matrix of scalars Q, I, J, which are non zero, such that C of Bi tensor of Bj is Q and J, Bj tensor of Bi. So this is the usual transposition, and you just twisted it by this matrix of scalars. Then there is a theorem by Heckenberger, which is a very difficult theorem, that says that 
In this of diagonal type, then all Nicholas algebras of finite dimensional are, are classified. There are some explicit lists, and I will comment on this list in a moment. So this is the first part of question one, which says classify all elements on Nicholas algebras of finite dimensional in some class, and for them find a presentation by generators and relations. And the second part of this first question in this context was answered by Angiolo, who proved that, who gave a minimal presentation by generators or relations of all the Nicholas algebras which are finite dimensional in these two papers. The first paper does not use the classification of the Kenberger, and the second paper does. Now, question two there, which says that P of B is equal to R, an affirmative question, answer to this question, would say that you do not have extensions of connected cofactors, which means that you can, you can stop at the first point. And this was, we devised it with Schneider a method to prove this question and apply it in some particular case, and Angiolo showed that this same method applies because he knows the relations for any finite dimensional content of algebras with a billion group, and therefore giving a positive answer to question two. And this is rephrased as follows: If H is finite dimensional content of algebra, then H is a with a billion, then H is generated by group-like and prim is Q-primitive elements. Not primitive, Q-primitive, it's my let me, let me discuss briefly the list of Heckenberger, because it, this is one of the things I would like to understand. I, I understand better, but not completely. The list of Heckenberger consists of several classes. There is one class which is of Cartan type. Cartan type means what I said at the beginning, QIJ, QJI equal to QII to ALJ. So these are related to finite dimensional simple reactions. Then a couple of years, or three or four years ago, uh, Yamane visited us in Cordoba and explained us, and we wrote it down, explicitly that many of the matrices in the list of Heckenbergers are of super type, which means that they are related to contragradient Lie super algebras of finite dimension. As you may know, these were classified by Victor Katz long ago. And for each of them there is one QIJ, which we call a super type. Now, this classification of Victor Katz and the classification by killing Cartan is in characteristic zero. In positive characteristic, there, there are classifications of contragradient Lie algebras and contragradient Lie superalgebras that are finite dimensional. And essentially, you have the same classes as in characteristic zero, except for some small sets of exceptions that appear, I think, in characteristic two, three, and five. Well, maybe if there is any a smaller, higher characteristic, doesn't matter, it's a very small set of characteristics. And in recent work with Ivan and Hyono, we realized that some of the matrices in the list of Heckenberger that are not of Cartan, that are neither of Cartan type nor of super type, are of super modular type. Which means that they come from these exceptions in characteristic 2, 3, and 5. And unfortunately, there are, or for, I don't know why unfortunately, there are 12 exceptions, which we do not know where they come from, so we call them UFO. Well, here is the definition of Cartan type, and then uh, we have this result, as all result by Schneider and myself. If this is of Cartan type, 
and the order of the QHS is relatively prime to 210, recall that 210 is 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, then the dimension of B of V is finite if and only if this matrix A and J is of finite type, so this explains the, the data in the first uh, slide. And B of V can be presented by generators and relations, and the relations are the ser quantum ser relations and the powers of root vectors as explained as the explained here. So I, what I have to explain now is how this goes to this. So I need to explain how this deforms to this, but I will not do it in detail, just give you the idea. Before that, I want to say, this conclusion that the dimension of B of V is finite, if and only if A and J is of finite type, holds without the assumption that the order of Q and J is always relatively prime to 210. This was proved by Hickenberger. However, this follows from the list of Hickenberger. However, the defining relations are more involved. So these two sets of relations, you need more relations. This was shown by Angiono and in the previous case, small case by Gascalesco and myself. If the order of G is relatively prime to 210, then all possible Vs are of Cartan type. This follows from the list of Heckenberger, and this is what allows us to finish the classification of the theorem. And if the order of G is 210, is relatively prime to 210, then R is uh, any error equally consumption was proved before by us, I said that already. So the last point to finish the proof of the theorem is to explain the question three. So how do we go back? The idea is the following. We have some relation R equal to zero in the Nicol's algebra, so this R is some element in the tensor, the homogeneous component of degree n of the tensor algebra of V, and R is zero in U of H. So in H, the same R should be equal to some R zero in one uh, element of smaller order in HA minus one, with respect to the radical filtration. Now, what we proved with Hans is that in case the order of G is relativity prime to 210, then R0 really belongs not only to HA minus 1, but to the co-radical, which in this case is the group algebra. And then we computed it somehow by some brute force. However, this made me more involved when R0 is when uh, even in the Cartan case, even if this is not one, or in general for other classes of matrices, this is not true in general. So we need some more uh, specific uh, tools. We are working on that with Angiono and Garcia Iglesias. Okay. One minute? Three minutes. Okay. I, I would like to say two things about non-abelian rules. So very roughly, without entering into the details. If you believe me what I said until now, you will say, now, to classify pointed cough algebras over a finite abelian group, you need to understand Nicol's algebra of diagonal type. So to understand Hopf algebras over a group which is not abelian, pointed to algebra with not abelian group, then you will need something different. This something different is related to the notion of rank that I don't want to explain in two minutes. But the current work we are doing goes into two directions. One direction is to compute some Nicol's algebra of finite dimension. And this is very, very hard because it's um, 
Here is the list of all finite dimensional Nicol's algebras corresponding to a rack and the cocycle, assuming that the rack is in the composable. So since we have a very small one, let me go by dimension to about technicalities, we have a very small example of dimension 12, which corresponds to the class conjugacy class of transpositions in S3. Then we have some that correspond to some affine, some uh, semi-direct products of two abelian groups. Then we go to the transpositions in S4, and you get the Nicol Sargent of dimension 576. And then we go to the transpositions in S5, then you get this huge of algebra. This, in, these are quadratic, these three related to this. But we really do not know why they are finite dimensional. We compute it by brute force or using computer, and there is some proof that they are finite dimensional, but the real reason is that escaped to us. I have to say that Heckenberger and Ben Ramin recently classified all finite dimensional Nicol algebras with decomposable rack. It's a different story and I have not time to explain. But and this is the last slide. Well, there are four more, but it's the last of the talk. On the other hand, we have some criteria to decide that the Nicol algebra associated to some racks and cocycles are infinite dimension. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, some 10 years ago we classified all simple racks, and this criteria reduced to compute some group theoretical property at the level of simple racks. So this classification of simple racks was possible because of the help of Robert Guralnik, and it reduces the classification of simple racks to the classification of finite simple groups. So we really have an explicit list, and we can go example by example, checking the condition that ensures us the dimension simply. And with that, we proved some theorems with Fantino, Vendramin, and Grania. For instance, we proved that if G is alternating group AN, or PSL to Q, with Q even, or some sporadic group except the monster, the baby monster, and Fisher 22, then the only finite dimensional pointed Hopf algebras are the group algebras themselves. So there are no Hopf algebras. And we also have some partial results for the symmetric group. These three exceptional groups, we did not finish it then because lack of information. And we are starting to work on finite simply groups of lead type and this is what we want to do so what i expect is that there will be no finite dimensional Hopf algebra associated except the trivial ones associated to a simple group and those that could exist are associated to a solo group however there is an exception which is this Hopf algebra transposition in s5 because s5 is not solvable so this is, in this moment, the main question. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the nice lecture. Are there some questions? I don't see any question. Yes. Uh -huh. Does it make sense to consider the group algebraic group and scratch some kind of algebraic group? Uh, uh, yes. One can try to consider one can try to consider a pointed of algebra where the group is algebraic and try to classify a Hopf algebras which have finite Kelvin dimension. 
And we, we did some work, but it's still... Uh, we have some papers on infinite, on finite case and kilo dimension, but there are many problems around there, so uh, I am really not eager to finish the finite dimensional cases. But some things can be said that can be done. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank you. Uh,